The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus told his disciples a parable about the necessity for them to pray always without becoming weary. He said, there was a judge in a certain town who feared neither God nor man, and a widow in that town used to come to him saying, render a just decision for me against my adversary. Now for a long time the judge was unwilling, but eventually he thought, while it is true that I need neither fear God nor respect any human being, because this widow keeps bothering me, I shall deliver a just decision for her, lest she finally come and strike me. The Lord said, Pay attention to what the dishonest judge says. Will not God then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night? Will he be slow to answer them? I tell you, he will see to it that justice is done for them speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, when I came back from the Holy Land, periodically you will hear little drips and drabs of my experiences there. And having been there in the Holy Land, the, the places where Moses prayed, the places where Jesus walked and prayed, I could never read the scriptures again without those visuals in my mind. So today, put yourself on the bus, going through the desert, headed toward the Jordan River. And the guide says to us, this is the area in which Moses confronted the Amalites. This is the area where he prayed and Aaron and her had to hold up his hands during that battle against the Amalites. We're not condoning war, we're not condoning one people beating up on another people, there's too much of that already in the world, but there's a message there <clears throat> that not the guide, but the Holy Scriptures gave us about the necessity of praying. And you heard it, very clear. Um, Moses is coming from, don't forget, he's coming in a, in a journey that's many, many, many years. He's coming from Egypt with his people, the Israelites, all, all 12 tribes, and they're going through, you know, it wasn't like an Uber, they didn't take a bus, they didn't take a train, they're walking through the desert, and believe me, believe me, hot, 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 hot. He, hills, mountains, but your friends in the desert were like scorpions and bugs and snakes. So it was a dangerous area. And as they headed toward the promised land, guess what? Other people lived there, and they didn't want to welcome them. They didn't want to let them cross their land. So the Israelites and the Amalekites had to fight. They got into a battle. And they weren't a fighting people necessarily, the Israelites, but they had something on their side because their destiny was ahead. Their destiny was to fulfill the Lord's invitation for them to come to the promised land. The, the land where they were supposed to be. Now read, and when we read skip, scripture, Read level by level by level. It's not just simply the story. It's the depth of the story. That's why we call it exegesis. We, we search out the full meaning of the story. And the story is very pretty today in the scriptures. While the people are fighting, God intervenes and inspires Moses to pray. Now you see the priests pray, and a lot of you pray like this during the Lord's Prayer. This is called the Oran position, the praying position. Uh, for Christians, it goes back to the catacombs in which we see people from the first century painted on the side of the walls of the catacombs, 
in this position. They're praying. They're open. I mean, the whole idea of it is they're open to God. So he's inspired. Hold your hands up. And his hands got tired. Get somebody to hold them up for you. And even when he got tired doing that, he put a rock under him to sit down. The comfort of prayer. Now again, this scripture is not a story about Moses and the Amalekites and, and the people of Israel. The story is about us. This is God speaking to you and me today. What is it showing? When Moses raised up his hands, God was with them. The people were conquering. When his hands got weary, the people were losing. So the inspiration is to keep your hands up. Praying. That's the key. Keep praying without ceasing. And if you need someone to help you pray, pray with that person. Pray for that person. And help the person who is praying. That's what we do. That's what Christians do. That's why we come here. This is the most important prayer we do, the Eucharist. Why? Because it has in its, in its concept what prayer is all about, which is the raising of our hearts and minds to God. And you can't get closer than the Eucharist in which we say yes to the body of Christ. And he becomes part of us. He's one with us. So raising our hearts and minds to God. And listen to the prayer of the Eucharistic prayer. All the prayer is always directed toward the Father. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. In imitation of Jesus. That's it. That's prayer. All intentions to the Father. Working out the example of Jesus gave us in our own lives. And of course, just the idea that we can pray is God's inspiration to us. And that, that's hit in another piece of scripture today from Timothy, but we'll talk about that. The, the voice, the pneuma of, of God, the power, the spirit of God inspiring us. So, so this, the scriptures today begin with a physical necessity of praying in, in, the, in the case of Joshua and Amalek and all, all the rest of them. And then the history goes on. So we pass through the desert and I can just imagine how difficult that must have been, whether they had armor or not, the heat, the bugs, and, and, and the chaos. But through all of that, and again, yeah, we're talking about the war, Amaleks and the Israelites. We're talking about us. You and I have wars that we fight every day. Sometimes internal wars. Choices that we make, or should make, or don't make. We fight battles every day with illness and prejudice. We fight battles every day with simple things, like even the weather. And people hurt in our areas, maybe because of the weather or a storm or a fire. So those battles are going on every day. And what's, what's our goal? Pray. Always pray. Raising our hearts and minds to God and telling Him, what we need, what we want, and the grace to deal with it. That's the important part. The beautiful letter of Timothy confirms this. We'll get to Jesus in a second, of course. Our whole focus is Jesus. But Timothy, this letter is um, misspoken. It's really, we don't know who the author is, but the author wrote in the name of Paul. No big deal. We'll let the scripture scholars worry about that. But we always say, Paul to Timothy. Timothy, in this letter, the whole letter, which you've heard the last few weeks, go home and read the rest of it. Timothy is saying he, he's ordained. He's becoming a minister, a priest, bishop, I don't know which one, but he's ordained. And Paul, in this letter, is telling him how to act. You're representing the community. You have to be a good role model. You have to, you have to remember, and this is our key here today, from the scriptures that you've known from your infancy. And the scriptures that you have known from your infancy are revealing to you Jesus Christ. He's not talking to Timothy, he's talking to you and me. Remember our faith. Maybe our parents give, gave us our faith. Maybe our, at baptism we received our faith. Maybe as an adult we became part of, of the adult community of faith. It doesn't matter. What we all have in common are the Holy Scriptures. 
to go back to them to renew what do we believe? Why do we believe? And it's there. From one book, Genesis, to the last book, Apocalypse, it's there. And it's funny how we use Scripture. We know it's all, according to this letter, it's all inspired by God for teaching, refutation, correction, righteousness, etc. And we always have to be equipped with it. But let me put that aside for a second. I had a professor in university, in seminary, his name was Raymond Brown, extremely well-known scripture scholar. And he started one class one day and he says, uh, today we're going to read this section of scripture. And he had the other side of the class read that section of, section of scripture. They were both scripture, okay? What this said, I don't remember the content, but what this side said was contradictory to what this side said. So he asked us to get into a debate. We missed the point completely as students, and we started debating the words we read. No, it says this. Well, it says here, it says this. And it was contradiction. And Ray Brown laughed, and he said, don't ever use scripture to prove a point, because the opposite point is someplace else. Because we're not talking about scripture being a phrase, a line, a book, a paragraph. Scripture is the whole thing, from Genesis to the apocalypse. All of God's word is given to us and just ourselves, our bodies are a good example of that. We have cells in every part of our body and they're all pretty important and they all play a pretty important role. So you say, well, I have cells in my hand. I don't, I don't need them. I'll just cut off my hand. I was going to do that. So the message of scripture is all through the scriptures, all of scripture. That's why when we read it, we pray it. Like this, you guys have missalettes, okay? I'm sure you have Bibles at home. Sometimes when you, when you come this week, look what the next re week's readings are. So maybe during the week you can read them ahead of time and speak to God through them. And then in the course of, of the celebration of Mass and the homily, those words would be more alive for you. That's what scripture is all about. And, and P.S., I'm not telling you to do what I don't do. What I'll do tonight is open up the, the lectionary for next Sunday, and I'll read it. And during the week, I'll read a commentary on every one of those readings. Why? Because it's my obligation, as Timothy's obligation, is to preach the word. But we all have to preach the word. I use words. We don't all have to use words. We have to preach the word sometimes by our example, how we love one another, how we teach our children to love one another, how we respect each other, how we look at, at, at each other's multicolored faces and languages and realize we are one family. Every day we need to do that, get into the scriptures. You're on a bus, you're on the tram, you're in a car. Well, don't do it in a car because that causes an accident. But read a piece of scripture. I have, I have it on... It, I don't like to drive, so when we're traveling, Jerry drives. So, and I put my earphones in, plug in my phone, and I listen to the scriptures for that week or that day, and commentaries. I make a boring guest in the car, because I'm silent, but he's happy too, because I'm not talking a mile a minute. Scriptures. Never cease praying. God is telling us left and right in the scriptures, I want to be one with you. Pay attention. Pay attention to what the message is for me that day. Okay, now we got to go to the dishonest judge. You heard the story. Woman comes before the judge, plead my case, give me my rights against the adversary and all that. Everybody knows what that means in the courts. And the, and the judge is, ah, get out of here, bother me, lady, get away, blah, 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 blah. But then he says, and this is a parable, it's not, it didn't happen. Jesus says, what does the judge say to himself? That dishonest, no good judge, what does he say? I'm going to give her her rights. Why? Because he has power. See, power in the place, wrong place is dangerous. He gives her her rights because she's, he's afraid she will beat him up. She'll come with a bat and do him harm. Okay, dishonest judge acting dishonestly but giving a good result, justice to the woman. What about God? Jesus says, 
This is a parable about a dishonest judge. Your father hears you, and there's no dishonesty in God. He's all good. He's all knowing. He's all loving. There's no dishonesty there. You don't think your father in heaven would listen to you when you come before him like this dishonest judge listen to this woman? He's totally corrupt. Your God is totally good. And Jesus is talking about his father. So he's got a little uh, prejudice there. Pro-father, pro-God, the father. He knows that. And he's telling us, that's how I want you to be with my daddy, my father. He gave us that phrase, you know that, the Lord's Prayer, Abba, Father. I want you to speak to him anytime you need it. You need him, you go before him. You want to thank him, you go before him. You want to plead, you go before him. You want to ask him to give blessings to your children or family, friends at a distance, you go before him. He knows you. He knows what you need. All you have to do is raise our hearts and minds to God to let him know we're connecting with him. And this can happen 24-7. You can do it with scripture, best way to do it. But you can do it in your mind as you're traveling or driving. You, you know what? That, I've got to give you an example of what prayer could be. Excuse me, what is your first name? Francesco. Okay, and you know, I, use, I use everything at my disposal. I'm sitting there and Francesca has two, are they your sons? He has two sons with him. He's trying to organize the book of, of prayers as he's, as he's preparing the song. And one kid puts a piece of paper in his face and Francesco had a sign, I don't know what it was. And the other kid is, you know, grabbing onto him because the other kid's too close. He wants to be closer to his father than the other one. Okay, you all know that. You all have a smile on your face because you all know what your kids are like. That's prayer. That, what they did is prayer. They're in church. They're acting as father and children. That's prayer. What makes it prayer is the intention. I'm here to pray, come to Jesus, but I'm here to show my children I love them and I'll pay attention to them. That's prayer. See, it's not a very complicated thing. Remember the pictures of John Paul II? Every time you saw him, he's down in contemplation, and there, was a beautiful muse there is a beautiful museum in Washington dedicated to him. I was there two weeks ago. And every, every picture you see of him, he's in prayer. And you say, what's he doing? He's talking to God. He may not be saying the Our Father, the Hail Mary, or the Confitio. He's talking to God. He may be saying, God, give me, give me peace so I can deal with these people. Give me patience so I can give them the right message. I don't know what he was saying, but he was praying. He was one with God. He was raising his heart and mind to God. That's what we're asked to do. Always. And the last phrase of Scripture is so beautiful. After Jesus gives this story about the dishonest judge, he says, but... When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Faith is activated by prayer. You pray for what you want and you believe. So Jesus is saying, when I return, I want to see you guys praying. I want to see you guys saying, Jesus, come on, come on, give me more, fill me up. Come on, Jesus, watch over my family and friends, and I'm sorry for what I did, and I'm sorry for the people I heard and screwed. I'm sorry for all that. That's what Jesus wants to hear, honestly, from our hearts. Why? Because we're raising our hearts and minds to his Father. Pray always. Don't stop. In the grocery store, on the, in traffic, when you're playing with your kids, pray. Unceasingly. Thank you.